This is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost here in Long Prairie, Minnesota. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Catholics in Rome, chapter 6. Brethren, all we who are baptized in Christ Jesus are baptized in his death. For we are buried together with him by baptism unto death. That is, Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father. So we also may walk in the newness of life. So remember, the newness of life is sanctifying grace. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin may be destroyed, and that we may serve sin no longer. For he that is dead is justified from sin. Now if you be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall live also to, together with Christ, knowing that Christ, rising again from the dead, dies now no more. Death shall no more have dominion over him, for in that he died to sin, he died once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So do you also account yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel. <clears throat> Taken from St. Mark chapter 8. At that time when there was a great multitude with Jesus, and had nothing to eat. Calling his disciples together, he says to them, I have compassion on the multitude, for behold, they have now been with me three days, and have nothing to eat. And if I shall send them away, fasting to their home, <clears throat> they will faint on the way. For some of them came from afar off. And his disciples answered him, From whence can any one fill them here with bread? in the wilderness. And he asked them, How many loaves have ye? Who said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and taking the seven loaves, giving thanks, he broke and gave to his disciples and set before the people. And they had a few little fish, and he blessed them and commanded them, to be set before them. And they did eat and were filled, and they took up that which was left of the fragments, seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about four thousand. And he sent them away. <coughs> Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, let me remind you that on the last week of September, last week of September is the women's retreat. And the first week of October is the men's retreat. So those of you who can make it, come. Try to come. The retreats are powerful. It's the old St. Ignatius retreats. And uh, Father Pfeiffer and I will be preaching them in Boston, Kentucky at the seminary. Seminary year, year will begin in October. Pray for the seminarians. Exactly 100 years ago, a few days ago, July the 13th, exactly 100 years ago, the Blessed Virgin Mary showed to the three children, <clears throat> she opened the earth, and they looked down to the center of the earth, and they saw hell. Sister Lucia describes what it was. She said, firstly, they would have died of fright had the Virgin Mary not been there. And had the Virgin Mary not promised to the three children that they would get to heaven. So that, that encouraged them, that gave them strength. But they looked down into the fires of hell. And Sister Lucia... In her memoirs, she describes the fires that are not burning bright. It's a black, a dark fire, and burns deeply and far hotter than the earthly fire. She saw 
the souls, some of them, being tossed around like sparks in a fire. And she saw the beasts of hell, the devils, who take on beastly forms, like tarantulas the size of this house, apes, centipedes, and squids, and whatever. The, the, the devil has a far greater imagination than Hollywood when it comes to horror films. And the devils, as you know, can they have power over matter. God gave angels power over matter. Angels can condense gases. Angels can bring in light and make something appear that's not even really here, but you can touch it. Like the Saint Raphael the Archangel, when he appeared to Tobias and even walked with him several hundred miles, Afterwards, Tobias said, I don't have a real body. What you see is an appearance. And when I appear to eat, I don't really eat. But I'm an archangel that stands before the throne of God. And the angels, they do have power over matter. So in hell, the devils don't lose, they don't lose their natural gifts that God gave them. Just like the damned, all the artists and musicians, there's still artists and musicians in hell. All the all the engineers and, and uh, movie actors, they don't lose their talents in hell. And anyone who goes to hell, you don't lose your gifts, your natural gifts. But they burn with them. So the, de the beasts of hell, the devils can take on beastly forms. And far more frightening than any, again, any Hollywood movie inventor can put together. And these devils are full of hate. They're full of hate. And if they could hurt you more in hell, the damned, if they could hurt them more and rip them to shreds more, they would. But even in hell, God restrains the devils. Because the devils, especially for Catholics and priests and religious, the devils want to wreak the greatest hatred on them. Those who are baptized, because the mark of the cross is on their soul, and it burns forever on their soul in hell. Priests. Many saints have seen priests in hell. They say that their hands have big crosses because their hands are consecrated, and they burn in hell. And they burn deeply. And the devils see the mark on the soul. The pagans, the Muslims, idolaters, who are not baptized, and Jews, who populate hell, they will not have that cross <clears throat> burning on their soul. But they will turn to the Catholic people, especially those who had the faith and knew the knew and had the chance to know their catechism and the true mass and the true sacrament. They will turn to the Catholics and say, What in the world are you doing here, you piece of blank, 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 blank? And they themselves will try to rip apart the other Catholic people, especially priests. And we know that Blessed Mary of Agreda, she, Our Lady, revealed to her that kind of an aping of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, body and soul into heaven, Judas, his body was dragged to hell. So right now, Judas' body is with him, his soul burning in hell, in the lowest of the regions of hell. Now we know that the Sister Lucia, the Virgin Mary, showed her only a part of hell. Because there's other parts of hell that are frozen in ice, where they cannot move, and they're just fixed in ice for all eternity in the most bitter cold. And then some parts of hell, as saints have seen, are absolutely freezing ice because Christ says there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping, says St. Anthony of Padua, weeping because the burning fires that burn in their whole in their whole bodies and souls. I see, after the resurrection of the dead, at the end of the world, the bodies will be reunited to the soul. So the bodies, like Judas now, will share in the flames, in the ice. And some parts of hell, they go from, a, from burning hot, weeping, 
to the freezing cold, the gnashing of teeth. The gnashing of teeth. And when, well, you're Minnesota folks, you know winters, and you know, <laughs> you know what it is to gnash your teeth when it is freezing and that cold chill cuts into your bones. The gnashing of the teeth. There have been bodies of uh, the English expedition in the 1800s of, uh, I forgot his name, that led the expedition. But anyway, they found the sailors. The sailors got trapped in an iceberg way up in the northern regions of Canada. And the first few of them died and they buried the men. And then the, the, the men alive tried to track their way through the snow and ice, and they ended up dying also. They all froze to death. But uh, National Geographic went up there and dug up these bodies of, of the men that had crosses, crosses or tombs in the ice, and they dug the bodies up, and they're still frozen. They're still frozen, but when you see their faces... These poor guys, they, you can see their faces, they were gnashing their teeth from the cold. They were really gnashing their teeth. They were probably Protestants, so I don't know if they saved their soul. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> as Protestants, they can't save their soul, but hopefully they died with a willingness to embrace the true faith in an act of contrition. But in hell, we know that there are parts that are freezing ice cold and then there's places in hell where they just can't move and Saint Teresa and also sister Josefa Menendez Saint Teresa of Avila saw her place in hell she said this was the greatest grace our Lord gave to me she said because she was already a nun at the time did you know that she was already a nun, consecrated to God. And our Lord showed her her place in hell because she was a lukewarm nun. And <clears throat> when she saw her place in hell, she changed. As a nun, she converted. She even converted and became more fervent and she's, she reformed the Carmelite order. But what did she see in hell? She saw these long tunnels in hell and in one of the side walls was a huge a crevice uh, and she was to be stuffed in there with spikes in it and burned there immovable forever that was her place sister Joseph and Menendez also saw that and they, the devils actually took her and put her in one of these these holes and as she was passing by the corridors, the long tunnels in hell, burning hot, she could hear voices speaking out from the walls, screaming and blaspheming God, cursing their little life on earth, and asking questions, why did I do it? Why did I do that? Why did I throw my whole eternity away for this stupid pleasure, for this stealing these, these useless things I don't even have anymore. And forever they cursed their life, forever they cursed the time they had on earth, forever they cursed their absolute misuse of their free will, forever they blasphemed God because they're fixed in the hatred of God. And this is the most horrible thing about hell. The loss of the vision of God that you can never see him again, and you can never love him ever. It's harder. It's hard for us to maybe grasp this because we don't really love God that much. And for souls who love God, they realize this is the most horrible thing that can happen: to lose the state of grace and to lose the vision of the Blessed Trinity. But we can understand it on a, on a more physical side of things, and I'll put it as a physical side of things. You know that this sermon is going to end because I got to say Mass and catch a plane. So I won't be preaching for five hours. But imagine sitting there for six hours listening to a sermon. You'd go crazy. I'd go crazy preaching it. <laughs> so, uh, and then you know that when you're sick and you've got a fever, you know if you take the right remedies, you're going to be better. You know when it's really hot, you can get out and get some fresh air and you get a cold glass of water. 
But in hell, it is the peak of panic mode suffering. Panic mode suffering. The, the fires of hell are burning at least, at least, at least 450 degrees Fahrenheit. And the fires of purgatory, we know, are burning at least that hot also. Because souls who have appeared from purgatory touched walls, touched tables, our books, and they burn deeply right into the pages or into the wooden doors. And those relics are there. There's the relic chapel of the, all the relics of purgatory in Rome. So how hot do you have to be burning to burn a hole through cloth or books or a, a door of wood? You've got to be burning well over at least 450 degrees probably in over a thousand degrees and even into the two or three thousand degree Fahrenheit. And that, as the Holy Ghost says in Scripture, who of you can endure eternal fires? Who of you can endure eternal torments? None of us. We know that. We can't even stand the hot room, 103 degrees, you're dying. But in hell there's no coke machines. In hell, there's no fresh air. In hell, there is no friendship. You cannot go to your friend and say, Look, I, I, this, this suffering is driving me crazy. And at least share your suffering because you're just going to hate each other. Family members will only curse each other and swear at each other and try to rip each other apart. Fathers against sons, daughters against mothers. It's ugly. Ugly. Friends that were on earth, who lived in mortal sin, like rock and roll bands, who say we'll have a party in hell. Well, they're burning, and they can't stand each other in hell. It's only hate. Hate for God, hate for the devils, hate for their suffering, hate for each other, hate for their whole short life on earth. <coughs> it is only hate, and there's no compassion in hell. There's no one to say, look, I understand your suffering. Nobody cares. But God from God will still restrain the devils from ripping up those damned if they could. Because the devils would tear them apart if they could. But even God restrains the, the fury of the devils on e and, on, and souls on each other. So many saints have seen hell and describe it. And it's pretty much it's pretty much as I'm describing. And it's and it is it is horrible. And one of the aspects of hell is it doesn't end. There's no end. It's eternal. For us we have a little difficulty grasping eternity, but you get reminders every day. Look out on a field. Try to count how many blades of grass. How many mosquitoes in the air at dusk up here. How many leaves on the tree. Try to give a count. And put a hundred years to each leaf on a tree or a blade of grass. And if you did succeed to count all that, and it came to billions and billions, and put years to that, it would still only be the beginning of eternity. Eternity is no joke. For the saints in heaven, eternity is an eternal now of, of joy, of the ultimate pleasures, of the ultimate joy of seeing the vision of the Blessed Trinity, of the laughter and joy with the saints, the dancing, the singing, the laughter, the innocence, the purity of heaven. And you, we all know that when you have a good time, Time passes very fast, right? Okay, kids, you can go out and play. At the bell, you come in for dinner. Right? Remember, as kids, three hours pass by, you're playing or jumping in the pool, doing flips off the diving board, and it's time for dinner. The bell rings. And you just say, we just got out here. Where'd the time go? Time flies when you're having fun. But in heaven... There's no time anymore. It's just an eternal now. Always the beatific vision. Always the joy. Always the endless discovery of new things in God. There is never a dull or boring moment in heaven. Never. It doesn't exist. 
God gives us boring moments on earth. And they are gifts, these boring moments. I wish I had some myself. <laughs> but boring moments are a gift because they remind us we're not made for this earth. And suffering is twice a gift because it reminds us we really aren't made for this earth. And this suffering can repair for our sins and, and make reparation. So... St. Ignatius, of course, in the retreats, he will have the retreatant remind the souls of the five senses that suffer in hell. First, the eyes. The eyes burn, and the eyes see. And the eyes see the devils. Who St. Catherine of Siena saw a devil. She writes in her dialogue, she saw one of the devils. She said, I'd rather walk on red-hot coals to the end of the world than to see that devil again. St. Benedict saw devils. The monks tried to move one of the rocks up on Monte Cassino. It used to be a pagan temple, so the devils still lurked there. And the monks, big tough monks, once barbarians, swinging axes and killing people on the battlefield, they converted, became monks. And here they are, no problem moving a boulder when you get five of them on a rock. And they just can't move it. And they turn to Father Benedict and say, we, we've tried everything, we can't move this rock. And St. Benedict seen, he said, don't you see the devils on it? And three fat, ugly devils were sitting on the boulder. And he made the sign of the cross and drove them away. <clears throat> and they left. So then they can move the rock, the boulder, no problem. So saints have seen devils. And they are hideous. They are ugly. They are ferocious. They are ferocious. And men's imagination can take, you know, house the size of a house, a tarantula or, or a black widow spider full of hatred coming at you. None of us would appreciate that, but it's not fiction in hell. It is not fiction in hell. And so the eyes see the fury of these devils. And some of the devils are little maggots. Take on forms of maggots and centipedes that crawl inside the mouth and ears of the damned. This has been seen in hell by saints. Whole mouths infected with ulcers and crawling with maggots because they use their mouths to blaspheme God, to cut up their neighbor, to accuse their neighbor of sins they didn't do, lie, their tongues crawl with maggots. And this is not fiction. These are saints have seen this and they've described it. And that's why one of the saints, like St. Saint Christina, she saw hell and when she came back on earth, she realized they thought she was crazy because she was doing such severe penances. And she said, this is nothing compared to hell. Nothing compared to hell. And then um, the sight of other people. This will really send chills up people's spine. You know, when you're in a big crowd and it's calm and it's a nice sunny day and no problem. When people are in panic mode, like being, imagine being in, in the towers at 9-11, when, when it was blown up and well blown up from within, all the way up, they could hear the explosions going up from within the building. So it wasn't the airplanes, that's for sure. It was pre-planned and pre-planned and it was pre-known and that's all being revealed now. But anyway, imagine being in that 9-11 building and you're, on the, you're in the room where you can't get out and the flames are going higher and higher and you're seeing people jumping out the window because they have no other choice. They either burn to death or jump out hoping the fireman below will catch them 500 stories below. <clears throat> and look at the faces, people crowding into the elevators panically trying to get down the steps, walking over each other, screaming over each other, panicking. And that happened, 9-11. You can see all the footage on that. And the, the New York Police Department, great, great heroes they were, they went in. And when they started hearing explosions in the street, they were the bodies hitting the pavement. It sounded like explosives going off. 
and the body is just splattering everywhere. The panic mode on people's faces at that moment, and anyone who deals with emergencies, they know what this means. One paramedic told me he came to a car. The car, there was a big accident. The gas tank leaked. There was fire everywhere. Children were trapped in the car with their grandma and three kids in the back. The kids were banging on the windows, screaming as the flames were just swallowing them up. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't get there. They couldn't, they couldn't rescue them. It was too late, too fast. And all they, they just remember the screaming, then the silence. But that panic mode of screaming in hell is forever. It doesn't end. It doesn't end. And people are not the same when they're in panic mode. And in hell it's forever that panic, emergency, suffering mode. There's no calm. There's no peace. And there's no love, nor compassion, no refreshment, and no end to it. And this is not Father Hugo trying to scare you, and Father Hugo, the Catholic Church, trying to scare you so you don't sin anymore. Who cares about Father Hugo? Our Lady showed the children hell. It's real. Christ mentions it over 63 times in the Gospels. Depart from me, ye cursed. Not into everlasting discouragement, but everlasting fires and discouragement and despair. And that's why these modernist popes who tried to wash away the fear of hell, when Pope John Paul II, for example, said there are no, no burning fires in hell, no corporeal fires in hell that burn the body. He's not telling the truth. He's teaching error. He's teaching error. And it's false. Because Christ himself calls the fires of hell fires. And then we know Fatima was a gift for our century and our age. Our age of apostasy, our age of vice and sin, our age soaked in impurity, soaked in blasphemy, soaked in heresies. And hell is real and is not a joke. So the sights of hell are enough to make hell complete. But that's not all. The hearing of hell, the screaming and the blasphemies the hateful language, and no love at all between even family members. The smell of hell. St. Bonaventure said if a soul came out of hell, that one body with its stench would be like chemical warfare. It would wipe out the human race. And you know those big tough cadets, young guys, college age, or 19, 20, 22 years old boys, who think they're all that and more and tough and nothing can bruise them and they're ready for a brawl and they all walk into the to the every military training they always put them through some of the some of the gas warfare just to put them in a simulation so they get a little bit of the taste of chemical warfare so they go through this room with chemicals, and they come out the other side. So when they go in, they're all standing tall and tough, and, and then when they come out, they're hunching over, throwing up, with huge mucus trains coming out of their nose, spitting up mucus out of their mouth, even coming out of their eyes and ears. And they get a little taste of chemical warfare. It's part of the training. And they at least can get out of it and get some fresh air. In hell, there's no fresh air. There's no getting out of it. It's forever choking in the most awful stench. The saints describe it as burning flesh and burning sulfur and brimstone. The smell of rotten eggs and burning flesh. That's the smell of hell. When Sister Josepha Menendez would descend into hell... And she would, for six or seven hours at a time, our, our Lord would allow her to be dragged by there, down there by the devils. It frightened her to death. Just think of this, the Spanish nun, beautiful little Spanish nun, dragged to hell by the devils for six or seven hours, many days at a time. 
And she would hear the screaming. She would see priests. She saw a 15-year-old girl in hell. She saw people of all sorts in hell cursing their life. And when she comes back from hell, she would be sometimes in the chapel praying and her soul would be dragged down. And when her soul would come back into her body, the nuns would be trying, her sister nuns would be trying to wake her up and smack her and pinch her cheeks. And then when she came back to color, and then when she came to her senses and realized she was back on earth, what seemed for many hundreds of years on hell, in hell, she'd come back on earth and she realized she could love our Lord again. And she wasn't forever separated from them. She would break into tears, realizing she, she wasn't forever damned. And then the nuns, would, they could smell on her the fire and brimstone, the burning flesh. It stunk with her. And even some of her inner garments were, tin, were singed with uh, the heat of the fires of hell. So these are gifts from heaven for all of us. The smell of hell, the scent of hell, the hearing of hell, the sight of hell, and of course the touch. The senses burn. It's not just burning on the outside, it's burning on the inside. Can you imagine having an IV put through your bloodstream of boiling hot water? And in hell, the whole body burns with the soul. And the saints tell us it is a mercy of God because the greatest pain is I have lost God, the supreme happiness. That suffering is so awful, it so gnaws at the mind and heart of, of each damned in hell. God, in, their, in His mercy, allows the flames to distract them. The suffering keeps them distracted. And then, of course, the remorse of conscience. The remorse of conscience. Ever lose your car keys? Drives you crazy, doesn't it? Ever lose your wallet, your identification? Now cell phones, cell phones now have all your whole office on there. You lose your cell phone, you lose tons of information you need. Ever lose something valuable? And people get upset, and some will even curse God over losing a, losing a pair of keys. But who of us can endure losing one of our right hands, or losing our eyesight? That'd be pretty tough, wouldn't it? Some people have to. Or losing your hearing. Or losing a leg from diabetes or an accident. Those are tough things. But you can still save your soul. But imagine losing your soul. Your soul forever lost. The soul, the only one soul we have. We lose that, we lose everything. And we only have one. One of the saints said, if you had two souls, you can save one and put the other to hell. But we only have one, <clears throat> and we only have one fight, one short life on earth, one chance, and we, we got this one chance to win it or blow it. And the damned in hell, they realize the vanity of all the pleasures on this earth, all the vanity of all the material things of this earth, all the honors and glories, and all the fame, they realize it is all hot air, it means nothing. The fame of Elvis Presley is already dying out. Wayne Gretzky, the greatest hockey player when I was growing up, and he was great. He's an old man now. He helps the, the Post Fall Boys in their hockey summer camps. So in his older age. But his, his trophies will all get rusty someday, and he'll die someday. Pray he dies a holy death and converts. But in a hundred years, no one will even know the name of Wayne Gretzky. Air Jordan will just be, oh yeah, it wouldn't even be known. And look at all the famous people of Greece and Rome and Egypt who, who had athletic competitions and won them in the Olympics. Does anybody know their names? We don't even know who they are. But we do know the names of saints. St. Paul, St. Philomena, St. Agatha. St. Cecilia, no one knew these girls, but they're famous because for those who love God, God exalts even on earth. 
We have cities and streets named after saints. But there is no saint, there's no city named after Nero. There'll never be a city named after Hitler, nor Stalin. Well, there's Stalingrad, but that's, that'll pass also. So, the remorse of conscience, the pain of loss, to lose our soul is the worst thing that can happen. So, dear faithful, an easy way to lose our soul today is to lose the faith. One can fall by sins against stealing or lying or charity, sins against purity, sins of drunkenness, but they don't lose the faith. But if we lose the faith, we lose it all, and our soul and everything. And that's why the devil, has, as the Virgin Mary foretold many times in La Salette, in Fatima, a hundred years ago, and Our Lady of Good Success in the 1600s, that the faith will be lost, the devil will erode the faith, and gradually make the whole world almost lose the whole Catholic faith. Very few will even keep it. Very few will even be interested to keep it, and very few will fight for it. And the few that actually fight for it, and keep it, here's what the Virgin Mary says, the poor priestly souls that are faithful, that would be left to uphold the church, would suffer greatly. Against them, the impious will rage a cruel war, overwhelming them with vituperations, calumnies, and vexations in order to stop them from fulfilling their priestly ministry. But they, like firm columns, will remain unswerving and will confront everything with a spirit of humility and sacrifice which which they will be vested. By virtue of the infinite merits of my Most Holy Son, who will love them in the innermost fibers of His Most Holy and Tender Heart. And she describes the suffering of the little children. Fight, says Our Lady of La Salette. Fight, you children of light. You few that have still the Catholic faith of tradition. The Virgin Mary summons you. She blows the trumpet. She says, fight, children of the light. You little number who see clearly, for behold the time of times, the end of ends. And this is our time when the faith will be lost and everything is ready for the Antichrist. So fight on, little flock. Keep the faith. Grow in the love of God. Study your catechism. Study the works of Archbishop Lefebvre. Read the encyclicals of the great popes before Pius XII especially St. Pius X and Leo XIII's encyclicals condemning Freemasonry. We have to fight for the kingdom of heaven. It does not land in our lap. What does our Lord say? <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and only the violent take it. Any athlete knows that. If you want to be a bench warmer and be lazy in practice, you're not going to be playing games, that's for sure. But you give 120% in practice, you give 100% in the game. And if that's the way it is for winning a trophy, how about the incorruptible crown of heaven? So fight on, little flock, and don't forget the words of Our Lady. If we are suffering this battle of the faith and have to stand up against the Pope, stand up against Bishop Follet for his compromise of the faith and his modernism and his dialoguing and praising Pope Francis for granting them now. Now they got the approval for confessions, marriages, ordinations, and confessions. Is that not one with the conciliar church? They've got the agreement without the name. They've got the agreement without the signature. They've got the abortion already planned and scheduled and it's already set. It's already happening. You don't need to sign the papers. It's already happening, right before their eyes. And they all say nothing's changed, even the priests. And now we have to stand up against Bishop Williamson and Bishop Zendeas and all those phonies fighting for what? They don't even know. They don't believe in the resistance. They don't believe in fighting Vatican II and condemning it in the new Mass. They try to make every excuse to go and get grace from the new Mass. 
And they're playing games with eternal souls and games with the eternal doctrines of the faith. And they have no right to do this. And as loyal sons and brothers to them, we have to stand up and oppose them also. So this is the war we're in, folks. Fight on. It's a glorious battle. And you'll be faithful if you stay close to the Virgin Mary. May she bless you, strengthen you. May, may she in this month of July, notice she came in July and showed the children hell in July, the summer months when many sins are committed. And then in October she'll appear like Our Lady of Mount Carmel. She'll, she'll appear in all the brown robes. And women know all about dresses. And, and Our Lady must have a massive wardrobe because all her apparitions, she has got a beautiful new dress each time. <laughs> so, ladies, you've got a lot to look forward to in heaven. You, endless wardrobes. And Our Lady will have the most beautiful of them all. And she appeared in, in October as Our Lady of Mount Carmel, whose feast is today. And she has the scapular and the rosary. The scapular will save us from hell if we die with it on. It's not a good luck charm, we all know that, but it's a sign of our consecration to her. Wear the scapular. She promises you won't go to hell. That means she'll make sure you die in the state of grace. What a good mother. What a good mother. And your time in purgatory will be shortened if you keep the rosary every day and wear her scapular and are close to her. So keep these weapons, because St. Dominic said, when he, or he didn't say, or the Virgin Mary told him, St. Dominic, one day through the rosary and the scapular I will save the world. Why? Because the, she wouldn't say that if Mass was available everywhere. She wouldn't say that if Mass was easy to go to. But she saw there'll be a time when you won't be able to get to Mass. The priests are going to be hard, hard put and traveling. We're back to the old missionary days. Even Archbishop Lefebvre said, don't go to the new Mass. If you can go every Sunday to the new Mass, don't go, he said. Better you have a true Mass with a priest that has the real faith and go once every year. And he even said in the missions in Africa, some tribes only got Mass once every three years, but they kept the faith through the rosary and the scapular. And that's how serious this battle is. You don't play with new Mass, nor fake Tridentine Masses of priests who want to play games with Vatican II and the new Mass. Just stay away from them. They're also illegitimate Masses. They've got the real Mass, but they're playing games. So stay with the real faith. Stay with the real Mass. Stay with the real fight. And Our Lady is leading the charge. Fight behind her. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us, Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.